Hi all, good morning and thank you for joining our webinar on the history, regulations, and success of ABMs today. My name is Lee Ritchie and I'm the Director of Marketing here at First Close. We appreciate you all taking the time to join us, so I'll provide a quick intro to First Close and our speaker today and then hand things over to George. Founded in 2000 and headquartered in Austin, Texas, First Close provides technology solutions to mortgage lenders nationwide. The First Close Reporting Suite is the first comprehensive solution with capabilities to deliver title, flood, valuations, including ABMs, and other important data elements in one report to help support home equity loans and prequalifications. Today, George Ponce will be educating us all on ABMs. George comes with over 15 years of lending experience, which has made him an expert in home equity lending. As an advocate for technology and innovative methods, George is sharing his knowledge in order to help take your lending programs to the next level. With that being said, I will now pass it over to George to kick off his presentation. Thank you, Lee, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to all those who were able to join today. During today's presentation, we will cover several key topics surrounding AVMs. What exactly is an AVM? What does it include? We will talk about the origin of AVMs. Where did AVMs come from? and how long have they been around? I know it sounds like science fiction, but there is a lot of science behind them. We will also cover the progression of AVMs, the fallout of the financial crisis, then impact to lending and AVM usage. We'll get into what are the advantages of using AVMs and how they can benefit your financial institution. And finally, we'll cover how to implement and maintain them. For financial institutions that are not using AVMs, this will be a great intro course. For those of you here that are currently using AVMs, use this as a checklist to ensure that there is nothing missing from your program and that you're doing everything you can to maximize the benefits of this technology. The presentation will run about 35 to 40 minutes. We ask that you hold all of your questions until the QA section of the program, where I will try to field as many questions as time allows. Let's jump right in. What is an automated valuation model, or AVM for short? This is not to be confused with an appraisal valuation model, which is a valuation tool used by actual appraisers. Similar but different. For the purpose of this presentation, we will focus strictly on automated value models. So what is an AVM? It is an algorithm that arrives at a property value using mathematical predictive models and historical electronic data. Wow, that's a mouthful. What does it mean? In layman's terms, it's a computer program that uses data in order to estimate a property value. Now, there is a multitude of data that the model will evaluate. It can include property characteristics, anywhere from lot size, bedrooms and baths, year built, living space, garage, fireplace. It will also use sales index data, what did homes in the area sell for and when, as well as demographic data and any other data it has access to. The program will take all of these available data components into consideration and generate a value in real time. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with AVMs, I want you to keep in mind how reliant the model is on data and also market activity. So now that we have a basic understanding on what an AVM actually is, what else does it produce? Let's get into the scoring system. Each AVM model will be equipped with some sort of scoring system designed to represent the accuracy of the value or result, a barometer of sorts, to measure how accurate the result is. The most common types of confidence score and forecast standard deviation or FSD for short. A confidence score will look at the value that the AVM generated when compared to an appraisal's forecast or the anticipated sales price and assign it some sort of classification. Confidence scores are typically represented by a number from 0 to 100, where 100 would mean high certainty. There are also other models where instead of a number, confidence score may be represented by low, medium, or high, with the same idea in mind. I would translate to a more accurate value as compared to medium. 
The higher the confidence score, the more accurate the value to what the model thinks the sales price or actual market value would be. Let's talk about forecast standard deviation, or FSD. FSD is a little bit more mathematical. It is a statistical measure that represents the probability that the value from the AVM will fall within a statistical range of the actual market value measured against a sales price. This number is typically denoted by a decimal. However, unlike confidence score, in this case, lower is better. The lower the FSD, the better the accuracy of the result. Think of this as a dartboard. Each of the rings will represent a deviation closer to the center. An FSD close to zero means the value would be closer to the bullseye, meaning the result would be closer to the sales price prediction. So that's an AVM, and those are the scoring systems that an AVM typically comes with. So let's talk about history of AVMs. Where did these supermodels come from? And I'm referring to AVMs. AVMs were originally developed in the early 60s to aid property tax assessors. This technology was referred to as CAMA models, or computer-assisted mass appraisals. In its infancies, these models used the same principles. They used index data for the purpose of property valuations. In the mid-80s, Locations Inc. built an AVM model with the help of Michael Sklars, a pioneer in the history of AVMs, to help price new property listings. As overall technology continued to evolve, so did the models. These predictive models started taking on a multitude of applications. Sales price strategies, collateral backed securities evaluations, and ultimately loan originations. Traditional appraisal methods were costly, timely, and subjective. The industry needed a faster and more cost effective way to do this. Wide application of AVM use in the financial sector became very prominent in the mid-90s. Affinity Mortgage Corporation was one of the first financial institutions to have and deploy automated decisioning coupled with AVM technology. Freddie Mac wasn't too far behind. By the late 90s and early 2000s, every major home equity lender was using some sort of AVMs, primarily for loan originations, but there were also cases for QC processes. Take that technology and couple it with stated income programs, high LTV lending, 100% plus, imagine that, and new streamlined processes, and what does it equal? Historical home equity originations. It's funny as we look at some of these logos and we wonder, where are these guys now? Now, all that fun could not last forever. Shortly thereafter, there were precipitous rate increases, and we all know how the story ended. But I would like to state that AVMs were not a primary contributing factor to the financial crisis. Contrary to popular belief, they unfortunately took some blame, wrong place, at the wrong time. Then the crisis came. What happened after the crisis? Major changes occurred. The landscape went from some regulation to lots of regulation. Big brothers stepped in, acts were passed, agencies respond. The intentions were good, however, as we all, and by all I mean lenders, felt there were unintended consequences with serious impacts to lending. Talk about slamming the brakes. In 2010, the OTS, OCC, and FRB published the Interagency Appraisal and Valuation Guidelines. The guidelines were designed to tighten up the requirements around property valuations. In essence, appropriate evaluation of real property collateral in lieu of an appraisal was required. We can, prob we can probably spend a whole day on this specific topic, but for today's session, we will just focus on the impact to AVMs. So what did all of this regulation do to AVMs? Restricted AVMs and electronic valuations. 
AVMs now had a limit of $250,000. The guidelines also provided a lot of direction with regards to using AVMs, which we will certainly dive into a little deeper later in the presentation. There were impacts to credit unions and banks. The FDIC and NCUA each had their own interpretation of the guidelines. So where did this lead to? Property condition reports were born. What is a property condition report, or PCR for short? I can tell you it's not an appraisal. However, based on the guidelines, a lender should have some sort of knowledge of the condition of their collateral property. So what does a PCR actually do? A PCR evaluates the overall condition of the property. It verifies that there is no visible damage and that the property is in average or good condition as compared to the surrounding neighborhood. Is the house that is my collateral for the thousands of dollars that I'm lending okay? There was a classic picture from that time period that I wanted to include in this presentation, but I wasn't able to find it. It was a meme in contemporary terms before there were memes, but it was two pictures of a house side by side. I want you to use your imagination. The front was what looked like a standard colonial home in a beautiful neighborhood, trees, windows, and the second picture was of the back of that same house and it was nothing but torn down rummage. It was titled something like pre-crisis lending. It was a jeer at lending without considering the actual physical condition of the property, which before the crisis, I'm sure there was plenty of. In any case, PCRs are very, very important to lending. So why use AVMs? Why are they important? What can it do for me? Well, for starters, they're instant. Imagine not having to wait weeks for a full appraisal. Or even better, giving your underwriters the ability to decision alone with an actual LTV and not just some borrower estimate. What can that do for you? What about the back and forth once the appraisal comes back in much lower than the borrower estimate, which we know happens way too often? People always think their homes are worth a lot more than they actually are. How much faster can I close my loans and start earning interest? Or from the consumer standpoint, how quickly can you get them their money? Another major advantage is cost, significant savings. We're talking about an average of $350 per unit. If you're currently paying for closing costs, Think of the impact to your contribution margins. As a product manager, as a previous product manager, this is huge. I'm making my product leaner. On the flip side, for the lenders that are passing this cost to your borrower, now that this cost is marginal, can I possibly entertain a no closing cost feature? What would that do to my originations? Can I be more competitive? Consistency. These models are computers. Appraisals can be subjective. Two full appraisals performed by two separate appraisers can generate two different values. Full appraisals are not an exact science and they are subjective. However, compared to AVMs, AVMs are a computer. If you run an AVM at the same exact time for the same exact property, it's going to generate the same exact result. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about disadvantages. So a couple of disadvantages to using AVMs. Remember when I said how reliant AVMs are on data? The model can only be as good as the data. If you're in an area or lending footprint that is either very rural or just not that up to speed with technology, this can affect your output of AVMs. Also, how much market activity? meaning activities present in the area or geography. Are there sales? Since these models rely heavily on sales index data, it may be harder for the model to generate an accurate value or even a value at all, which we'll get into hit rate in a little bit. So that's one disadvantage. 
the area that you lend it. Also, the condition of the property is not considered, but we talked about PCRs being able to fill that gap. I have here true comps. What is that? The model will consider characteristics as opposed to a traditional comp selected by an appraiser. This means that there are other factors that can impact value. Think of two properties that look exactly alike. Same lot size, you're built, beds and bats, but are on separate sides of the tracks. Different schools, different neighborhoods. The model will consider these homes as comparable where traditional appraisal or appraiser may not, therefore generating a different value. But keep in mind that this value should still be represented in the confidence score. Okay, so now that I have a basic understanding of AVMs, the benefits and advantages, how do I go about implementing them? Well, choosing the right model is the first step. There are so many models to choose from out there. Just name some of the, the, the leaders in this, in this industry, Collateral Analytics, Vero's Value, CoreLogic, GeoAVM, Home Value Estimator, that's a Freddie Mac product, PASS, Value Point 4, Power Base 6, there's so many. How do you pick the right one? Due diligence. Talk to your provider. Ask questions. Talk to us. First close. Your provider should be able to answer your questions, but I would also go one step further. Get the white paper describing the models. Each of these models has white paper. Read information. Ask questions. Do your own research and get informed. Find out the differences between the models. Are they better in certain geographies? Do they operate differently with certain property types? Can an AVM generate a value on a condo, multi-parcel? How are these property types considered in these AVMs? Evaluate the vendor's scoring system. Does the scoring system provide an appropriate indicator of reliability and accuracy as per the interagency guidelines directly. This goes back to confidence score and FSD. Even more important, understand how the model performs in your lending footprint. Okay, now that I have done all that brain damage and I have a couple of models in mind, test the model. This is required, and this is, this is truly, truly, truly important. This will ensure that the results are credible and accurate. Another requirement directly from the interagency guidelines, credible and accurate. Test against what you already know. You should have, if you're not doing any AVMs, you should have plenty of data to test against, full appraisals, purchase data, do as much sampling as you can. Validation can be done internally or by a third party. I recommend doing this internally if you have the resources. By resources, I mean, do you have data mining folks? Do you have analysts that can decipher the results? Keep that in mind because I'll also touch on that in a little bit. So once you do your testing, what did I find? How did the model stack up? Hit rate, paramount, number one. What was the model's hit rate? Meaning, how many AVMs out of your sample pool actually generated a value? So as I'm testing, think of how many AVMs actually generated a hit. That's the first piece, because that's gonna tell me, does the model perform in my lending footprint? The second piece, how accurate were they? On an overall percentage, were the AVM values higher or more conservative across the board? Industry-wide, when you look at it nationwide and you look at several models, AVMs are typically higher. But once you dive deeper, it may all change. Did property values play a role? 
Did he operate differently in certain counties? Did you find any correlation to confidence score or FSD? That's right. Did the white paper stack up? Once you did your own individual testing, were you able to confirm that there actually is a correlation between higher confidence score and higher accuracy? Once you validated the model, start with compliance. Yeah, compliance, those guys. We all feel a certain sort of way about compliance, but it's absolutely necessary. Confirm with your internal compliance department about the use of AVMs if you're not doing it today. If you are doing it, check with compliance as well. You don't want any of those penalties or any of those auditors uh, finding issues with your AVM program. Now, the max loan amount as per the interagency guidelines is 250000 Depending on your institution type, whether it's a bank or a credit union, a property condition report may be required. Now, when I think of ABM use, let's just say compliance is signed off on it, great. How do I use it? What are my, what are my, what is my criteria? What are my guidelines? Define the criteria as to when to use an ABM. This criteria should be developed with your model test results in mind. For example, if my testing showed that on average, AVMs are 5% higher than the benchmark, I may be understating my LTV. I may want to reduce my max LTV in a case where I'm using the AVM as validation. If I lend it 85% max, LT, max LTV and I'm using an AVM and my testing said that they were 5% higher, maybe I just want to use AVMs with a max 80% LTV or maybe my underwriting should be aware of that or cognizant. Another example, was there any correlation between accuracy and geography or even accuracy and property values? In my previous lending life, I saw an inverse relationship between property values and low side variance, meaning the higher the property value, the more conservative the AVM. This may be because, as we mentioned before, the AVM doesn't take into consideration the interior condition of the property. The value from the AVM may not consider the ivory countertops or the 24 karat gold bathroom fixtures. Again, this may be different based on your lending demographics. The reason why I recommend doing your own internal testing is because this level of detail may not be included by a third party. A third party may just say, give me a thousand addresses. Oh yeah, out of those thousand addresses, the AVMs came within 3% of the actual values. Personally, again, as we mentioned before, I am an advocate of data. Love it. Take that data on your own. I'm not going to be satisfied with just a general uh, you know, overall interpretation of the data. I will want to dig in and find out more. Why is this important? Because this goes back to defining your criteria or guidelines. How are you going to use the AVMs? All right, so what are some applications and uses for AVMs? There are uh, loan origination, as we talked about, and there's also servicing. You may want to do AVMs on your entire portfolio periodically. This will help you gauge collateral risk and help mitigate some of that risk. That line of credit that I wrote at 80% may now be 90%. Or even in a, in a rapidly declining market, maybe at 100. Should I consider reducing or even freezing some of these lines of credit? Very, very important. If my particular market is declining, do I need to allocate more allowance towards losses? So, implementing AVMs, which is a big part of our presentation. Choose the right model. Talk to the right folks. Do your homework. Validate the model. Test the model. Ultimately, determine your AVM use. How are you going to use AVMs in your loan fulfillment? or even your servicing. Plenty, plenty of applications for AVMs. Maintenance. 
What do I do now that I've been using ABNs? I'll tell you. Keep an eye on your utilization rate. What is utilization rate? It's how often you use these things. What did you originally set out to do? Was it 30%? In other words, did I want to use an AVM on three out of 10 loans that I write? Where do you draw the line? Can I do more? How comfortable are you with the AVMs? I can tell you that if you do everything that we've outlined, you will be comfortable because you're going to have the data yourself. And once you interpret that data and you apply it to your lending guidelines, it's easy. Now imagine this. If 90% of your loans are under 150000 should you ever pay for a full appraisal again as per the letter of the law? I'm going to let you think about that for a second because for some of you small lenders out there, that may be very, very, very true. Let your guidelines grow with your experience. If AVMs are working, can you do more? Test your model. Be proactive. Make sure that the model is still accurate and credible as per the interagency guidelines. Now, the guidelines state that you should test your model in a timely period. What is timely? Is that once a month? Probably not. Is that once a year? Maybe not enough, but at least, at least twice a year, I think, is a good recommendation. Also, make sure the model is still performing. Is there something better? Or am I using outdated technology? Am I still using a model that hasn't grown or developed for about 10 years? Think about that. Talk to your peers. Talk to your vendors, talk to your providers, talk to some experts, talk to us. That is, uh, that is we're a little ahead of schedule. <laughs> that, is the, uh, that is the presentation. Um, I'm going to get into some Q&A. We had some questions that were submitted previously. Did we get any questions uh, in the meantime? We haven't yet. Okay, so you guys are just taking this all in, huh? <laughs> no questions. All right, so I'll go over some of the questions that were submitted by some folks. And as you guys are taking this all in, think of, uh, think of questions that you want to ask. Uh, please do not be afraid. There's no judgment here. All right, so are there AVMs for HELOCs or first mortgage purchases? Okay. Um, the way I'm going to answer that is uh, portfolio versus non-portfolio. Okay, so typically, first mortgages, whether they're purchases or refis, the 30 years are non-portfolio. So that means that you're selling those in the secondary market, either to Fannie, Freddie. Does Fannie or Freddie accept AVMs? No, they do not. So in those cases, you will you will still have to do an actual appraisal. That was one question. I have another question that says, AVMs, AVM use in place of resort of value. Um, that's a little tricky. So is a resort of value, uh, is that being done on a specific property that may have had some construction? Can you use an AVM for that? I would recommend no. Um, or are you just recertifying some of the appraisals that you did on existing properties? Um, again, you know, I would, I, would, I would refer back to your testing. Did the AVM model stack up against your full appraisals? Can an AVM be used for a standalone valuation? I would, I would check. I would check with your compliance first. Um, like I said, the letter of the law says you can use an AVM up to 250000 um, I can tell you that there is a difference between the NCUA and the FDIC interpretation of those guidelines. Um, the NCUA never went back, um, never went back and, and, and redid their guidelines. So, but uh, FDIC did. So a PCR is required. But again, don't take my word for it. Check with your compliance folks. 
Great. We did just have a question come in. Have you found that regulators want lenders to shy away from using hit rate as a measure of AVM acceptability? In other words, do regulators want to focus more on model accuracy when determining, determining which model to use in a given location? That is a great question. Uh, so I think, I think what I'm hearing is, is if a, regular, if a regulator steps in, are they going to be concerned about hit rate or accuracy? You know, um, when we talk to some of our new clients and they say, hey, um, how do I pick the right model? I ask them specifically, what's more important to you, hit rate or accuracy? I think from a regulator standpoint, what they want to see is just, I, it goes back to the interagency guidelines. Have I done my testing? And if I were to pick one, you know, and again, this is from the interagency guidelines, credible and accuracy are probably is paramount. So, um, so I, if, if, if I were to say accuracy is number one, but again, some, some lenders, depending on your risk appetite, uh, you may lean towards hit rate because, again, hit rate equals cost savings. Okay, and we have another one that came through. Can you say that an AVM product that combines models together is usually a better product compared to the single model seller? Absolutely. There are products out there that have 20 to 30 submodels built into one model. Um, if I were to, if I were to kind of give you a visualization of what that looks like. Um, think of think of a carbon atom with a lot of other carbon atoms attached. I mean, um, yeah, and this just kind of goes back to the evolution of AVM models. You know, back, back when this first started, um, you probably had one model looking at like five little different items, and then that went into 20. And now you have models laid on top of models. Does that mean that you produce a better result? Probably. Perfect. Any other questions? I we do. We have a couple more. We are considering using AVMs for HELOCs in place of 2055 for low LTV loans. Is that consistent with the industry? Does it conflict with any compliance guides that you are aware of? Okay, so I'm going to go back to depends on if you're a credit union or a bank, but um, in my opinion, the 2055 traditional drive-by appraisal will be obsolete in due time. I, you know, there's way too much technology, and like I said, as this technology continues to evolve, a uh, product like that is just not going to be necessary. Two reasons: one, again, you now have computers that can do a lot of that of that digging, and two, um, you have what's called hybrid valuations out there. Um, which don't require an actual appraiser to go take consideration of the property. I think what you're seeing now where the industry is headed is these type of hybrid valuations that will take an AVM and couple it with a property condition report and generate a value. That leads perfectly into our next question. Can you please speak further on when a property condition report is required? Um, property condition reports, um, Again, it's my understanding that uh, banks do require one, the NCUA, again, it's a little blurred, but I will tell you this, um, as a lender, okay, as a lender, um, depends on what your area is. If you're in an area that was, let's say, recently impacted um, by some natural disaster, you know, I think of, I think of, of my own example when I was lending in the Northeast, right after Sandy, um, oh yeah, property. If I'm if I'm using an AVM, I'm going to want to make sure that property is still standing there. Um, you you can also think about flood zones. If a property is in a flood zone, and let's say you went through a, a, a major storm, uh, yeah, I would check the condition of the property again, understanding your footprint and understanding your comfort level with AVMs should tell you when to use a uh, property condition report. Okay, and we have a follow-up question. Do you have any recommendations in terms of how to score models at a local level? If I'm trying to rank testing results from five different models, what metrics should play a role in those rankings? Well, the scoring systems. So keep an eye on uh, how the confidence score or the FSD 
actually stacked up once you're actually testing these models. Um, again, the, the, model, the model is only as good as the data. So if you do your testing and you're not getting a lot of hits, um, there may be a model that's better than the other one. And then so that's the first piece. And the second piece is um, how did the confidence score stack up? Any other ones? That's everything I have. Should we go into some of the other oh, ones? Here's one more. Okay. Does interagency guidelines require a certain threshold confidence score? No, they do not. But can you build one into your actual lending guidelines? Um, sure, sure you can. As, again, as long as you are confident that the confidence score actually represents some degree of accuracy. All right. Well, um, I appreciate everyone being able to join us today. So in conclusion, AVMs and technology will continue to evolve as it has been. The performance of these will just continue to improve. At some point, one may ask the question, who's better at predicting value, a program or a human? Using AVMs can transform your current lending operation. Imagine not ever having to wait for a full appraisal, or imagine the cost savings behind it. What can you do with less overhead? Can you write more loans? Can you better serve your members? Can you close loans faster? Ask yourselves, right now, how can AVMs separate you from your competition? We are first close. Thank you for your time today.